Yes, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker today, Thierry de Duc, and de Duc is a professor at Hunter College, City University, New York, and has been working on Duchamp since the 80s, and I'm sure that... 70s. In the 70s. 70s. Yes. <laughs> 75 is when I began. And, yeah, I'm sure that the Duke's work has inspired many of us in here, and I can't mention all your publications on, <laughs> on Duchamp, um, but I need to mention just a few titles, some of your most important books, as I see it, uh, and it's Kant after Duchamp from 98, uh, the, definitive, the unfinished Marcel Duchamp from 93, pictorial nominalism on Marcel Duchamp's pas uh, passage from painting to the ready from uh, 91, and uh, also shown in the switcher uh, on Marx. So, and we have about 45 minutes for the talk and the following discussion. Um, and uh, yes, looking very much forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is this is to yeah. You can also do it. right. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Jacob, for inviting me. Here. Um, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I will try to keep on um, keeping time, and I apologize for having been a little late. We went to. Your, the office of your bill, uh, we went to your office building instead, so I apologize. Good, the story of fountain, hard facts, and soft speculation. Last year's centennial of fountain brought us a harvest of new books and articles on the famous or infamous urinal. I read a few in the hope of gleaning enough newly verified facts to curtail my natural tendency to speculate. I'm afraid the report is not much new under the sun. To take just one example, I learned from Michael Taylor that it is not Duchamp as I thought, but rather Henri Pierre Rocher, who appears as a ghost in the photo that shows the urinal hanging from the lintel of a doorway in Duchamp's studio on West 67th Street. The wall text in the 100th anniversary show of Fountain at the Philadelphia Museum of Art added that Rocher also took the photo. The apparition is certainly compatible with the subject of the photo setting the camera on time exposure, running to take his place in the frame, and running back to deactivate the shutter. I can see Duchamp doing that, but why would Rocher do it? Why the complicated selfie technique? if Duchamp was present? And what was Rocher doing in Duchamp's studio if the artist was absent? You see, I'm forced to speculate, even as I would pre be grateful to Michael Taylor for offering me hard factual evidence. Newly discovered facts are few and far between, and William Camfield's rigorous study of the Fountain dossier, which dates from the late 80s, remains the soundest basis on which all of us Duchamp scholars must rely and then speculate. Since speculate we cannot avoid, let us start from the only fact that perhaps qualifies as a hard fact when we speak of the Armat affair, the existence of the second issue of The Blind Man, and in it the double page that informs the world that a controversy involving a urinal has shaken the Society of Independent Artists a couple of days before its first show was scheduled to open on April 10, 1917. The left page exhibits a photo of a urinal accompanied with a triple caption. Fountain by Armat, photograph by Alfred Stieglitz, and the exhibit refused by the Independent. Three times the word by. Three allusions to an agency. What kind of agency? It makes some sense to say that Armut 
claims to be the author of the fountain, and a lot of sense to say that Stieglitz is the author of the photo, but it doesn't make much sense to say that the independents are the authors of the fountain's refusal. One doesn't author a refusal the way one authors a work. Though the word by repeats itself identically, nothing forces us to characterize the implied agency as identical. The three captions deserve a closer look. Fountain by Armand. On the page facing Siglitz's photo, the editorial, titled The Richard Mutt Case, clearly and straightforwardly states Armand's agency with regards to Fountain in capital letters. He chose it. Choice is or is not a straightforward concept, depending on whether we as art historians decide to ignore or not that Duchamp is hiding behind the pseudonym Armat. Let's put our hindsight knowledge in parentheses and try to read the Richard Mutt case with the same ignorance of who was hiding behind Armat as the 1917 readers of The Blind Man. He chose it is prefaced with the following statement. Whether Mr. Mutz with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. The editorial consistently speaks of the fountain, lower cased and not italicized. Fountain is a common noun simply naming a genre of public monuments. As in this other passage, Mr. Richard Mutt sent in a fountain. If it were not Festiglitz's photograph, we might think Mutt sent in an object in the same vein as Elizabeth Pendleton's drinking fountain for birds, which we know was exhibited at the Independence, thanks to Henry McBride's illustrated article in The Sun, dated April 8, 1917. The Richard Mutt case editorial does not state that Mutt made the fountain into art, merely that he placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object. However, in referring to the word fountain as the new title, the editorial suggests that fountain is a title and thus not simply the common noun of a genre of public sculpture. Moreover, it also suggests that the object in the photo already had a title before Mr. Mutt gave it a new one. Objects have a name, but not a title, unless they are seen as works of art. To this oblique and ambiguous allusion to art, the last paragraph adds a direct and blunt one, emphasized by being printed in large, bold typeface. As for plumbing, that is absurd. The only works of art America has given are her plumbing and her bridges. <coughs> plumbing and bridges do not have titles the way works of art do, yet the editorial presents them as being evidently art, independently of Mr. Mutt's intentions <coughs> and opinions. The innuendo that the fountain had been from the outset waiting for a new title a new point of view and a new thought to see its latent art status fully come into the open runs through the whole editorial and strikes a particularly subtle note in the paragraph that defends the urinal against the accusation of being immoral with these words. It is a fixture that you see every day in plumbers' show windows. Not in public men's rooms as you, would, you might expect reading every day, but rather in show windows or in showrooms, such as the spectacular outlet of the J. L. Mott Iron Works Company at 118 Fifth Avenue, where Duchamp bought the other. It is not usage that the editorial underlines, it is exhibition, precisely what Max Fountain has been denied. You might think that only a European, or at any rate a foreigner, could have written 
The only works of art America has given are her plumbing and her bridges. But this is not so. As Kurt Varnado has discovered, the front page of the Trenton Potteries Company publication of May 1915 remarked, someone has said that so far the great contribution of America to art is the pure white American bathroom. And Varnado to add, the display of sanitary fixtures was moreover a developing studied craft by this time. Trade journals admonished that, quote, artistic display of sanitary plumbing facilities is promotive of increased sales, end of quote. And the Mott Company boasted that its showrooms were, quote, artistic and beautiful, end of quote. Booths at trade conventions were judged, quote, from an artistic viewpoint, uh, end of quote, and prizes were awarded for presentation. Remarked one such review of a sanitary pottery show, flatly, this display is a work of art. As Marlado concludes, quote, Thinking about toilets as art was an already existing practice. <laughs> there is thus nothing far-fetched in reading the Richard Mutke's editorial as insinuating that the fountain in the photo was a work of art already, even before Mutt chose it. Images culled from professional publications of the time amply confirm that elevating bathroom implements to quasi-art status was common because it was good commercial strategy. In June 1909, the journal Sanitary Pottery, issued by the Trenton Potteries Company, then in its first year, rather crudely adorned its cover with a photo of the Trenton showroom that has five urinals, a line on the wall amidst a row of toilet seats. The editors subsequently developed more refined presentation strategies geared specifically at the middle class clientele for whom owning a full porcelain bathroom was an enviable bourgeois luxury. For the cover of the 9th, July 1915 issue of the magazine, they hired an artist who in typical linear Art Nouveau style represented two ladies of the world in awe before the bathroom trinity, tub, basin, and toilet, on view on an elevated plinth. Bathroom trinity, by the way, is the expression Karl van Vechten, one of the rare insiders in the Armut affair, used when he wrote to Gertrud Stein, Stieglitz is exhibiting the object at 291. We shall soon examine whether the fountain was exhibited at 291, Stieglitz's gallery. What is sure is that objects of its kind, perhaps not urinals, but toilets certainly, had already been the topic of an exhibition in an art museum two years before the independence show. In April 1915, John Cotton Dana, director of the Newark Museum Association, curated an exhibition titled New Jersey Clay Products that included vitreous china water closets and earned the following comment from a critic. To see what is called sanitary ware and drain pipes and the kind of tableware in use in quick lunch restaurants and building bricks solemnly displayed in the guise of art certainly would disturb our museum pundits. Yet, over in Newark, there is a director of a library and art museum who has had the courage to do just a thing as this. Two conclusions at this point. One, in 1915, water closets were already deemed worthy of an exhibition in an art museum. If not in the name of art, then in the name of good design, or what in Germany was called Kunstgewerbe. In other words, a urinal was not art, but it could be art. Two, 
It seems that Richard Mutt chose a particular model of urinal with the same discriminating taste for good design, or is it artistic quality, as a curator who chooses a specific piece for a sculptor's retrospective. Art historians are not in agreement as to what particular model Mutt chose. Cam Fields opts for either the 1902 heavy vitro adamant urinal 839Y or the 1908 Panama model, but both sold by the J.L. Mott Ironworks, while Varnado argues for the flat back Bedfordshire urinal with lip offered by the A.Y. McDonald Company. Does all this matter? For the scholars who take the urinal to be a gesture or a concept, the search for the right model is nothing but hair-splitting aestheticism. But to see the urinal as a gesture or a concept, I would argue, is to project onto the year 1917 the visors typical of the reception of Duchamp's ready-mades in the 60s and 70s. No reader of the blind man learning in 1917 that Armat created a new thought for that object, would have concluded that the object in question had been reduced to a thought. Fountain was not conceptual art avant la lettre. Aesthetic considerations entered Armat's choice. It remains to be seen what considerations and for what purpose. Two, photographed by Alfred Stieglitz. Stieglitz's agency with regard to the fountain is quadruple. He saw it, he aestheticized it, he made it into art, and he photographed it. The question of who, besides Duchamp, saw the urinal with his or her own eyes is still open. But the number narrows down to his accomplices Henri Pierre Rocher, Beatrice Wood, Walter Arensberg, perhaps Louise Norton, John Covert, Joseph Stella, and Calvin Vechten, on the one hand, and on the other, the directors convened to an emergency meeting to decide on the fountain's fate. There were 20 founding members of the society, but according to Campfield, only a group of about 10 was gathered to decide on the issue among whom Arnsberg, Rockwell Kent, George Bellows, and William Blackens are the only ones we are almost certain attended the meeting. The public never got to see the oracle, nor did the journalists, who otherwise would have called the litigious object by its name, rather than coyly citing a bathroom fixture or a familiar article of bathroom furniture. And then there is Stiglitz. <coughs> he saw the fountain and had to absorb the shock of discovering what kind of an object it was. According to Beatrice Wood, he was greatly amused, but also felt it was important to fight bigotry in America. He took great pains with the lighting and did it with such skill that a shadow fell across the urinal suggesting a veil. The piece was renamed Madonna of the bathroom. I am not so sure that Stiglitz was amused, at least not before he had taken great pains with the lighting and succeeded in turning a urinal into a Madonna. Stiglitz decided to photograph the fountain, but not without first making it into a piece of sculpture whose gleaming surface and elegant curves could be appreciated aesthetically. He bathed the object in soft light and propped it against the background of a Marsden Hartley painting that contained ogival forms echoing the urinal's contours, something that is not readily observable in the photograph. As Michael Taylor perspicaciously noted, this relationship would only have been seen by those present when the photograph was taken, a revealing insight into Stieglitz's mindset. Stieglitz could only fathom the fountain if it was art. 
So he did everything to make it art, at least to his own eyes. Then he photographed it, in protest against the independence betrayal of their democratic principles, a cause he took very serious. Indeed, in addition to making sure the incident was recorded, Stieglitz contributed a letter to the blind man, dated April 13, where he maintained that in the future, all entries to the independence should be anonymous, so that, quote, each bit of work would stand on its own merits, end of quote. And on the 19th, he wrote to Henry McBride, the Sun's critic, I wonder whether you could manage to drop in at 291 Friday sometime. I have, at the request of Rocher, Covert, Miss Wood, Duchamp and Company, photographed the rejected fountain. You may find the photograph of some humans. It will amuse you to see it. The fountain is here too. On public view, as Calvin Vechten thought, certainly not. Siglitz was not only a photographer, he was the director of a major art gallery located at 291 Fifth Avenue, not very far from the J.L. Mott showroom. There, he had shown Rodin's watercolors and Matisse's drawings, and was representing a stable of American avant-garde artists, among whom were Hartley, John Marion, Arthur Dove, and his soon-to-be wife, Georgia O'Keeffe. As much as he sought to aestheticize the urinal and elevate it to art status, he also wanted to make clear that he did not endorse our nuts to the point of showing the fountain at 291. He had not much respect for the clique of Rocher, Covert, Miss Wood, Duchamp and company. And he thought at the time that Duchamp was a charlatan. When Carl van Vechten wrote to Gertrude Stein, Stieglitz is exhibiting the object at 291, he was running ahead of himself. Only the happy few were invited to witness what the mysterious bathroom fixture the independents had censored looked like. There's a detail in Stieglitz's exquisitely crafted photograph that is strangely at odds with his aestheticizing efforts and his careful mise-en-scene. The urinal does not sit centered on its base. One, on second view, this casualness seems so contrived that it makes the mise-en-scene appear even more deliberate. With it, Stieglitz seems to be saying, the urinal may sit like a Buddha on the pedestal, but it landed there provisionally for the mere purpose of being photographed in protest against the independence and not in order to be exhibited as a valued work of art. And on third view, when you compare Stiglitz's photo with a doctored version that centers the urinal on its plinth, something else emerges. The original version of the photo gives the urinal plus base an elegant contraposto that makes it far better aesthetically than the doctored version. Better, that is, as a photo, it doesn't make the urinal look better. In the end, Stieglitz must have been satisfied that the fountain was art, not because of its intrinsic artistic qualities, but because the photo was a work of art he could be proud of. Finally, the exhibit refused by the independents. What was the independence agency with regard to the fountain? They refused it, they censored it, and they made it into anti-art. Unlike the Jewish refusal of Manet's the Déjeuner sur l'Herbe at the 1863 Salon, the refusal of the fountain by the board of directors of the Society of Independent Artists was a clear-cut act of censorship, perpetrated in blatant violation of the Society's principles, no jury, no prizes. The forewords to the catalogue of the Society's first exhibition stated, The Society of Independent Artists has been incorporated under the laws of New York for the purpose of holding exhibitions in which all artists may participate independently of the decision of juries. The great need, then, 
is for an exhibition to be held at a given pe period each year, where artists of all schools can exhibit together, certain that whatever they send will be heard, and that all will have an equal opportunity. Exhibitions in which all artists may participate, artists of all schools, certain that whatever they send will be heard, etc. Guarantee was given to all members of the society that their entry to the exhibition would be shown and thus treated as art, without any judgment as to its quality. There is no deny denying this guarantee. The society's very existence was founded on it. The first sentence of the blind man's editorial, they say any artist may exhibit, confirms Article 2, <coughs> Section 3 of the society's bylaws. Any artist, whether a citizen of the United States or of any foreign country, may become a member of the society upon filing an application, therefore, paying the initiation fee and the annual dues of a member, and exhibiting at the exhibition the year that he joins. Sections 4 and 5 specify that the initiation fee would be $1 and the annual dues $5. With appropriate irony, one journalist expressed the inevitable conclusion. Step up, ladies and gentlemen, pay six dollars and be an artist, an independent artist. Cheap, isn't it? Yet that is all it costs. You and I, even if we've never wielded the brush, can buy six dollars worth of wall space at the Grand Central Palace. So that the editorial's first sentence really means they say anyone paying six dollars may exhibit. It seems that, with the exception of Arensberg, who was in the know from the outset and gleefully played the game, the founding members did not realize that they had inadvertently abolished all rules of art making by decree. If anyone with six dollars to spend was an artist, and if artists of all schools could be certain that whatever they said would be hung, then, at the Society of Independent Artists, anything whatsoever, why not a urinal, could be art, and the founding members should be ready for that. They were not. But they immediately understood that Mutt had taken advantage of something they had not thought out, thought out in all its consequences. And for that very reason, they knew Mutt had set a trap for them, intentionally. That is what I mean when I say they made the fountain into anti-art. They, not he. They imputed the prankster, the intention to ridicule the conception of art they stood for. Mutt, they thought, must be an arch-conservative who has viciously reached for the scandalous and the far out in order to discredit the independence principles. Or he must be a total anarchist, set out to make fun of the bourgeois liberalism the independents professed when they wrote that every school is represented at this salon from the most conservative to the most radical. Was this indeed it, uh, Mutt's intention? Mutt had no intention, no intention of his own. We can no longer, at this point, read the blind man's editorial as if we ignored who was hiding behind our mat. Richard Mutt is a creature of Marcel Duchamp. But we should be careful not to project onto Duchamp in 1917 what we know from statements he made much later, such as his various diatribes against retinal art dated from the 60s. Duchamp's intention in 1917 can only be divined from his agency with respect to the three agencies that the repetition of the word by in the captions to Stiglitz's photo conjures up. Duchamp's agency vis-à-vis -vis Richard Mert is clear. He created him, and he chose a name for him. Duchamp's intention in creating and naming Mutt 
are almost as clear. He needed a pseudonym behind which to hide, because he wanted the independents to ignore who was the center of the Europe. But his choice of mud is ambiguous, or better, duplicitous in that respect. Mutt deliberately sounds like a pseudonym and therefore raises suspicion and invites speculative interpretation. In a discreet but straightforward allusion to Mott, the real maker of the urinal, and a not so discreet allusion to the cartoon characters Mutt and Jeff, which no New Yorker would fail to recognize. It is a discreet, etc. With her characteristic lack of humor, Catherine Dreyer complained in a letter to William Blacken, dated April 26. I told Covert at Arnsberg that in my judgment, Richard Mudd, and she didn't know who Richard Mudd was, of course, caused the greatest confusion by signing a name which is known to the whole newspaper world as a practical joke. Mutt, Mutt and Jeff are too famous not to make people suspect, if their name is used, that the matter may be a joke. Dreyer was so eager to believe that Mutt had been serious and sincere that only in horror did she entertain the possibility that he might have been a practical joker. Was that the point of Duchamp's choice of the name Mutt? Did he want the sender of the fountain to appear as a practical joker? Yes, but then only as a foil, a cover-up for the veiled seriousness with which Mutt alludes to Mott. When you think of it, the difference between the two names is not even a letter. You change an O into a U, the way you crack open a soft-boiled egg by chopping off the top. <laughs> and that oh-so-subtle amputation is enough to bring about the most sophisticated reflections on the actual making of urinals. Are they handmade? or industrially manufactured goods. The publications of the sanitary pottery industry stress the handmade. The reception history of the ready-mades stresses machine aesthetics, dehumanization or post-humanization, contempt for the hand, etc. Both are equally ideological. To realize that Duchamp shows ready-made a handmade or semi-handmade product might complicate both narratives. What now was Duchamp's agency vis-à-vis -vis Stiglitz? What was his intention when he decided that Stiglitz, not Man Ray or Henri Pierre Rocher or an anonymous photographer, should photograph the fountain? He knew that Stiglitz was not just a photographer, should, uh, all, uh, albeit a famous one but also an art dealer commandeering the needless ultra of avant-garde art in New York. He knew that fountain being at 291, even for a few days, even visible only to a happy few, would be obtaining for the controversial urinal the sanction of art history in advance. Duchamp manipulated Stieglitz, no doubt. How? This is where the aesthetic criteria with which he chose a particular model of a urinal the gleaming white surface, the Hans Arp or Brancusi-like curves, the potential formal evocation of a Buddha or a Madonna, and so on, set in. They were a trap set for Stiglitz, and he fell into it. He wouldn't have aestheticized the fountain to the point of making it into art if he hadn't felt that the object had aesthetic potential, in spite of its plebeian and radically non-artistic origin. Finally, what was Duchamp's agency vis-à-vis -vis the independents? He set a trap for them too, and they too fell into it. And what was Duchamp's intention in setting that trap? Did he want to mock the independent struggle to liberate artists from the strictures of the National Academy? Did he want to delegitimize them? Not at all. Otherwise, he wouldn't have waited until the exhibition was over to reveal that the controversy involving a urinal had shaken the society on the day before the opening. He wanted the board of directors of the independents to refuse and censor the fact.
fountain. That was his only goal. And it was that goal that commanded the choice of a urinal. And it didn't matter what particular model of the urinal this time. It didn't even matter that the object was a urinal. As long as its choice made sure that the directors would be outraged. Or maybe not outraged so much as afraid. What would a urinal make them afraid of? Clearly, that if the object were exhibited, it would discredit the whole society make them appear as fools and kill their project in the cradle. They could not, would not allow that to happen. Duchamp seeking rejection of the fountain was a wager. What if the directors had already been accustomed to the public display of porcelain urinals in an art exhibition and had decided to go along? What if they had remembered that Duchamp had exhibited two ready mades at the Bourgeois Gallery a year before and guessed who was hiding behind our mouth. What if they had been more embarrassed at the pro prospect of antagonizing a founding member as prominent as Duchamp than of exhibiting a urinal? It was a wager and Duchamp won. The independents censored the fountain and betrayed their principles from which we gather that to make them betray their principles was Duchamp's ultimate goal. But then why? Duchamp's ultimate goal begs the question of his ultimate motivation. My time is up. I'll leave that question dangling. Most of you Duchamp scholars know the answer anyway. Thank you.